Next, I want to talk to you about relating in subsistence marketplaces. Now, the picture I want to paint for you is one where people may be poor materially. They may be constrained in their thinking, their feeling, and their coping, but they can be rich socially or relationally. And I say can be because it's always a double-edged sword. Rich relationships, rich social networks can cut both ways. So let me paint this picture to you. I want to point out that they can be richer socially or relationally, much richer than I am. A lot of things in life for me are transactions. But for people living in the low income range, they could be a lot richer and relationships mean a lot to them as well. I'm going to explain an extreme scenario that actually happened. I was interviewing a woman in South India about uh, how she buys. And she buys from the neighborhood retailer, a small shop. He gives her credit. And what happens is he jots down prices. And typically, he would mark up on generic products. So this is what he does. And at one point in the interview, I asked her, do you check prices? And she said, no. Imagine how the shop owner would feel if I check prices. Now, this is not a typical response at all. So I don't want to make too much of that. But I want to make a few points with it. Well, I listen to that and I say, wow, why are you buying at this store? You're paying more. There are these larger retail outlets a couple of miles away. Prices are lower. And you don't have to pay this extra premium because things are on credit. So the rational thing for you to do is to go to the big store at the beginning of the month and stock up. That's the rational thing for you to do. Now, I want you to think about this. I just mentioned what the rational thing to do for somebody who is an expert on survival, whose life is filled with uncertainty. Look at how my rationality is based on my certainty. I said, go to the big store at the beginning of the month. So I assumed right away that people are on a monthly income. Well, she could be selling flowers, her husband could be a carpenter. We just don't know. And we don't know how seasonal their income is, whether they're on daily wages and so on. So there goes that certainty, that assumption. Second, I said that she should stock up at the beginning of the month. Think about that. If she stocks up and uses up any liquidity she may have, what happens when she has a big crisis, a health crisis, or having to pay her child's school fees? Those are big crises. She's willing to starve. She has the resilience to starve, but she has to take care of those crises if they arise. And finally, here she is. She goes to the large store, buys things, comes back, and the shopkeeper calls her and says, you know what, repay all my loans, and then you don't have to buy here again. What does she then do when she has her next crisis and needs credit? The large shop will not give her credit. So the point I want to make with all of this is this importance of a mutual learning mindset. I don't deny that we are experts on a number of things, but let's give this to the communities we study. People in subsistence marketplaces are experts at survival. Their rationality is one based on their uncertainty. So let's be very aware of that. I'm not saying we don't have anything to bring to the situation at all. That's not what my point here is. I think and I have seen hundreds of students contribute. My point is that it's important to step back, unlearn what we think we know, let things come to us bottom up, and then put it in perspective. So in our language, we talk about immersion and immersion. So immersion is going in and understanding how things work. Immersion is stepping back and then putting it in perspective. So this mutual learning mindset is very important. One other example of rationality. One of the most rational things I've heard in my life was when a poor woman in a village uh, was asked by me, do you plan? And she said, why should I plan? Why should I plan when I don't know where my next income is going to come from? So in this setting, what happens is that 
buyer and seller, customer and entrepreneur are two sides of the same coin. There's a shared adversity. People learn from each other. I learned to be a customer by being an entrepreneur because that may be my only way up or my way out or my way just to subsist, survive. Uh, so similarly, there's learning from being a customer in order to start a small enterprise. And all of this is playing out in a one-on-one -on -one interactional, intensely personal setting. And this is what I mean when I said these settings can be relationally rich. They can provide a way for people to learn about the marketplace. Just to give you an example, if I think of somebody who's third grade educated in the US versus in a Mexico or a Tanzania or in India, who do I think has more marketplace literacy? I'm making a sweeping statement because there are lots of variations, but often people living in conditions such as in a Tanzania and so on will learn from each other in this one-on-one -on -one interactional setting and try to improve their skills. They're also going to be exploited. This is not a rosy picture. This is a very harsh world. On the other hand, in an advanced economy, if I'm low literate and I go to the store, I have to know how to read because a certain level of literacy is assumed. There's a lot of technology that does the addition for me. And as a result, I don't have the same pathway to learn from others and move forward. It's very ironic that in an advanced economy, if you're low literate and poor, you're often quite left out of the marketplace. Now, how do these marketplaces work? Think of an entrepreneur and she has to manage a number of different entities. Let us say she makes a small food product. So she has to think about her supplier, make sure uh, her supplier is paid and she gets good supplies. She has to think about her customer, give the customer credit, and the family suffers. And the family suffers because the entire purpose of the enterprise is to take care of the family. This is not some aspiration to be an entrepreneur. It's been called necessity entrepreneurship in the literature. This is not opportunity entrepreneurship. And in that setting, everybody knows, I've got to do this, that's how we get money, that's how we eat. So the family is the buffer. I got to make sure my customers get credit if they want, I have to make sure my supplier is paid, and the family is the buffer. And then along comes a health crisis, and she has to go to the supplier and ask for credit. She has to go to the customer and say, please pay me back because I have this crisis at home. My family cannot be the buffer in this situation. And so she moves these resources among these three entities. And these resources are very fungible. The reason I'm giving you this example is because very often microfinancing institutions will give a loan for a business to be started. And some may say, you know what, I gave you a loan for a business, but look what you've done. You've used it as a customer. Well, that's the reality. All of these things are blurred. To have these neat compartments, you need resources. I have a compartment in my house, that's the den, that's the television room, this is the bedroom, this is a study, this is a kitchen. I have a mental compartment, this is my relaxing time. All of this gets blurred in people's lives because they don't have the resources. And so these resources are moved round and round and round. The reason I'm telling you this is also because this is the power of the bottom-up approach. By understanding bottom-up, you then say, well, I have to design that microfinancing uh, product in a slightly different way. And who is the right person to actually be the lender who then understands when to be flexible and when not and so on. So it's very interesting to take this bottom-up approach rather than a top-down approach to understanding needs and communities and so on. I mentioned that these are one-on-one -on -one interactional settings. The exchanges can be quite fluid. Uh, basically, if you bargain too much, what you get will be a little less because it would have been weighed a little differently. That's the weighing you'll get for that bargaining is often something sellers will tell you. There's a constant demand for customization. Everybody wants a certain way in which to get their product in this one-on-one -on -one setting. 
And the exchanges can be quite responsive. If you're a small seller, you do have to take care of the customer. Now, of course, there are exploitative sellers as there are exploitative buyers. But they do have to take care of the community because it's all one-on-one. -on -one. Right? So these are some of the things that happen. In terms of relationships, they're often enduring, at least at the level of a small buyer and a shop in a particular locality, because the way the small buyer develops the relationship and multiplies their small purchases is by buying in the same place. The shopkeeper knows them, will give them credit, and so on. And there is also a form of interactional empathy. And I don't want to paint a rosy picture. This is not my purpose at all. But what I mean by interactional empathy is the understanding that everybody is trying to struggle and make a living. So if I start a coconut shop outside a temple, and uh, you, know, you come and start one right next to me, I'm going to fight with you. But if you start one 50 feet away, well, you have to make a living as well. So there is this interactional empathy, perhaps, in some of these things. So what I've described to you is a one-on-one -on -one interactional setting where relationships are strong, but people could be materially poor and constrained in their thinking, feeling, and coping. Yet, as I mentioned, they are socially or relationally rich. When you compare somebody with a third grade education in an emerging market setting uh, versus an advanced economy, it's very interesting. Because of this one-on-one -on -one interactional setting, people are able to learn from each other and get exploited by each other as well. But it does give them a platform from which to develop their skills. So as a result, let me make one more sweeping statement. If you compare somebody with low literacy in these two settings, an advanced economy and an emerging market, the people who are in an emerging market where there is more widespread poverty may actually have higher marketplace literacy or functional literacy in the marketplace. Uh, that is because they are constantly counting, learning from each other, and have the shared adversity and a one-on-one -on -one interactional setting. Sometimes we've noticed that people with low literacy and low income in an advanced economy tend to be quite isolated. They deal with stores that assume a certain level of literacy, and they have technology that adds for them as well. So this is one of the interesting things, the ironies about being in a context of more extreme poverty versus a more advanced economy.